from the Mavi Emanuel tragedy two years ago to Walter Scott to the very latest on hate crimes across the country, I sit down one-on-one -on -one with We Are Charleston co-author in South Carolina, Port Laureate, Marjorie Wentworth for a special edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And be sure to download the free Quentin's Close-Ups app in your Apple or Google Play stores. Well, Marjorie, it's so good to see you again. Yeah, not running down the street. <laughs> yeah. I'm always busy, you know, time is valuable. I, know, I, know. I admire that about you. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Well, let me jump into the obvious. And this was posted on the Citadel School of Humanities website last mm -hmm. night. It says this, come check out our event at 645 on Tuesday, November 28th in the Ball Hall 165. Offers Bernard Powers, Marjorie Wentworth, and Herb Frazier will speak to cadets, students, and faculty, staff members of the Charleston community about the ideas represented in their new book, We Are Charleston, Tragedy and Triumph at Mavi Emanuel. So what are the ideas? Well, um, we certainly talked about the book and the, the usual presentation we do when we speak about what happened here. Um, we had met with the Dean of Humanities and the Provost and others there a couple weeks before that, and one of the things they said to us was, you know, some of the cadets, they just started here, mm -hmm. they didn't live here, no. um, there have been so many mass shootings, they may not quite know what happened. So even though it was a local right. audience, um, we certainly went through that at the beginning. Um, it was very crowded. There were, uh, it was standing room only. Mm. Um, certainly a lot of cadets were there and, and pe you know, faculty and, and, and people and staff as well as um, people from the community, I guess. Mm. I mean, anyone. You could have sure. gone. Um, so there was definitely uh, great interest, but we, we what we've done is um, we, we root what we say in the story in the book that we wrote, uh, what happened at Mother Emanuel, but we try to put it in the context of what we're seeing today in terms of race relations, um, the, why, the rise of um, hate crime, the rise of what, well, the more obvious rise of white supremacist, um, what's happened in Charlottesville, uh, the, the, we've been uh, there was another church shooting not that long ago, um, of course, in Texas, and that shooter um, had, you know, communicated um, with like a Facebook friend at the time of the shooting here in Charleston that he really admired Dylan Roof, and um, you know, so between um, the mass shootings that have occurred and the hate crime, the rise, the rise in hate crime and white supremacists. Um, events that we've seen, you know, these all go back to what happened here in Charleston. And the other thing that's interesting, um, we all know that the flag did come down a week, a month later, the, the Confederate battle flag. But since then, 60 Confederate monuments have come down in the right. South. And um, invariably, when you read about it happening in, say, New Orleans, um, there's a few sentences in the article that talk about this shooting. So even though we've gone through the trial and Dylan Roof is never going to get out of jail, um, and the families are doing the best they can to live their lives um, without their loved one, um, this story is tied to things happening in our country in ways that w most of us don't stop and think about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are people who admire Dylan Roof so much they get that haircut like his. Um, you know, um, he, as we all know, should not have been able to buy the gun that he used at, at Mother Emanuel because he had a record and there are people working hard to, um, to change that so that the waiting period to get a gun is longer, as you probably know. Um, but the same thing happened with um, this uh, the shooter in Texas. He had a he was court-martialed and he he had a criminal record. He should not have been able to get a gun, and yet he he did. So you know these issues haven't gone away. Um, they're all still um, happening in our country in, in horrific ways. And um, so what we did was try to 
you know, talk about what happened here and the, the sort of history um, and, and the sort of lessons of what happened here, but also explain that the ways that um, it's tied to where, you know, things that are happening now. I guess that's a good way to put it. Does that make sense? Um, I can't answer you know, that. In, 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 no, but in ways that you really, it's really horrifying. Um, you know, I think the other thing that happens, you know, that another church shooting, and even though the circumstances were different, um, the horror, of course, the results are the same, and the families of the Emmanuel victims, it, it just rips them apart. They have to go through that every time. And, um, uh, you know, I just think that the one place we think we're safe is church. And I know in our church now we have these panic buttons all over the place that yeah. you can hit. I mean, I think this is pretty common. I know in the college where I teach, we just there's, was just had training again. If there's a shooter there, we have, video, you know, we're trained to deal right, with it. Right, and right. Um, it's like, you know, um, we're an armed population. And um, I, you know, I guess you're not safe anywhere. Uh, we try, I mean, we all sort of go through our days and try not to think about it, but um, it's pretty easy to get a, a military assault weapon, and um, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's horrifying. Um, and then the rise in hate crime and the rise in, um, in, um, in gun violence are probably tied together. I don't know, but um, they're both statistically, um, both set of statistics were up in 2016. How do we get here? How do we get here? I don't know. And, and you know, the other thing, we got to look at the whole world. I mean, there's a really, this sort of isolationist um, policy and um, sort of anti-immigrant, you know, it's, it's not just here. Um, it's, it's happening in a lot of places, and particularly Western Europe. I don't know. I mean, I think... Um, I think it's a combination of reasons. I mean, it, it's hard to say with, say, the white supremacists. I mean, you know, we all know Dylan Roof was influenced by um, these white supremacist websites. Um, you know, it's not like that thinking wasn't already out there. Um, because of some of our leadership um, encouraging them, not really um, discounting them, I mean, just today, uh, President Trump tweeted something from some fringe white supremacist group in England that... Retweeted. Retweeted, excuse me, yes. Um, you know, that, that's, that the people are already in jail. And, you know, so, so you've got this um, floating in the air, uh, I don't know what you call it, Twitter, air, whatever, um, in ways that it, it was there before, but it, it, was, it was hidden. Um, I think, uh, and then the rise in anti-Semitism is just, I, I don't really want to understand why that happens. Um, this sort of, the idea that, that people of other races or faiths are, are causing crime and that, you know, I mean it's simply not true, but a lot of people think it's true. Um, people like to blame others for their problems and not take responsibility for um, their own issues. I mean, that's sort of just human behavior, <laughs> I guess, at that level. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist, but um, you know, I don't. I don't know exactly why. I mean, a lot of people think that in the 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 racism, in particular, um, is a backlash against Obama, um, the eight years of Obama, and I don't know any other way to explain it. I I do know. People, not people I, um, um, who I consider friends, but people I know through um, work or what have okay. you, who really, white people who just, when Obama first won, um, it's as if, like, they just didn't believe that something like that could happen. Um, and I think that it, they just were kind of seething for eight years. Uh, you know, I, I really believe that... Um, uh, the only way I can make sense of a lot of this is um, I read everything that um, I never know how to say, ta Coates writes, and I really think that, um, you know, almost everything that this administration is doing is trying to undo 
what President Obama did, the way, you know, Mitch McConnell said when President Obama was elected, we're just not going to let him accomplish anything. Um, and so now this unraveling of, of, you know, everything from environmental um, um, policy to the health care. I mean, why don't people want people to health care? I mean, I don't really understand this stuff, but it's all part of this reversal of any accomplishments that he had, and I don't know how else you understand. You can really understand it. I, I mean, I don't know how else to make sense of it. Um, it's beyond what I would consider political ideology. Um, and clearly, there's a lot of people in this country who really, really, you know, believe this stuff. There's a lot of people who don't really know anybody who doesn't look like them and think like them and vote like them. Um, and, you know, I think the larger issue is um, a kind of not feeling like we're part of a community. And I think that a lot of this ideology comes from that. You know, this just people don't feel that they're their brother's keeper. Um, and that's, that's really, we are all going to suffer for that. Let me stay, uh, let me actually go back to the Citadel, because you actually posted this on your Facebook account on November 10th. You said this, quote, while Bannon was speaking at the Citadel, some of us was, were speaking across the street. Hashtag one Charleston, hashtag one nation with the heart. When you think back to that speech that Steve Bannon delivered to the Citadel Republican Society, what sticks out to you? Well, I tried um, watching it okay. last night to to my homework before, or no, the night before last, because <laughs> I had to sit all last night. I really, um, I what really sticks out to me is the meanness. I just don't, I, I just that, the meanness of it is is just, um, I, I don't. Why do you have to be so mean? You, it, it just takes it out of being an intelligent dialogue, and he is a smart guy. I mean, <laughs> really smart guy. Um, I don't understand why Republican leadership wants somebody like Bannon who says overtly, I want to split this party apart. I don't, I don't understand. Like, <laughs> how is that a good thing? I, maybe I'm missing something here. Um, I think that uh, it was important to to speak up and, and just gather with people who are really upset and frightened about what he says and um, his actions and his support with, you know, his, in terms of the media, uh, with Breibart, uh, Breibart um, of really supporting this, this sort of um, isolationist, uh, racist, anti-Semite, anti-immigrant, you know, all that stuff. Um, you know, he, he's really trying to foment um, this kinds of feelings and it, it creates um, a lot of anger and a lot of pain in our society. And from what I've read, he, that's what he likes to do. Um, now, you know, we don't have a hate speech law in the United States. Um, and free speech on campuses has become a huge issue all across the country. Um, this was not a Citadel campus event. People will say, well, you know, they could have prevented it. And, well, you know, if, a, if an organization wants to invite someone to speak on their campus, that's, it, you know, you don't have to agree with that person. I mean, they had every right to invite him is what I'm saying. I think people in Charleston felt that given what happened here, um, particularly um, what happened at Mother Emanuel, that inviting what a person who many feel is, is uh, certainly believes in white supremacist ideology was particularly offensive and, and um, what, um, just kind of rubbing salt in the wound, you know, I, I don't know. Let me um, ask this, if you were to sit down with the young guy who's head of this the Senate Republican Society. I met him last night. Yeah. What would you say to him one on one? Well, you know, he, um, I, you know, it was hard last night. I met a lot of people. I was really glad he came. Okay. And um, he um, seems, he seemed to really, I mean, you know, seemed to really enjoy our talk. 
He didn't seem to be BSing me. Um, I, I think that one of the, I think what one of the things that's, that's really concerning to me, and I talked to him about this, is that we make assumptions about somebody based on one thing we know about them. I mean, people look at you walking down the street and they think one thing. People look at me walking down the street and they think another. Um, and we're not, we're not, uh, we're multidimensional. Um, and what struck me about this young man, he seemed very open-minded. Um, he didn't have any hateful rhetoric to say. He seemed to really like what we had to say. And, you know, we were talking about police, the, the police brutality against unarmed African Americans. We talked a lot about Walter Scott. Um, we talked a lot about Colin Kaepernick. Um, he seemed to welcome that conversation. And um, so, on the other hand, he, he clearly votes differently than me. Um, but I wasn't like I was going to get into it with him with all the, there were like all these people around and he, he made an effort to introduce himself um, and shake our hands and um, that's a dialogue and that's the kind of thing, that's why they had us come to the campus um, and that's what should be happening. It, it shouldn't be, um, it sh if everyone's yelling at each other and saying, you know, accusatory, hateful things toward one another, uh, we're not moving forward. We're just, you know, f it's like it's like throwing a ball back and forth and it never goes anywhere. Uh, you know, so that's the kind of thing that has to happen. Um, I would say I don't really know at the Citadel campus what the percentage of women, it, I don't know the percentage of minority students, I don't know. I would say we had a higher percentage of minority students there, a lot of African American students, it was an Indian, a young Jewish student introduced himself to us. Um, but they seemed very, um, overall, all of them seemed very um, open-minded grateful for the opportunity to kind of talk about these things. Um, the school itself just won a grant to study transitional justice and have a focus there. So they're really working hard to create um, create a, uh, I mean, I don't know exactly what they're doing because they're just really okay. starting, but they, they seem to, that this is the faculty administration, um, they've got things in place there. They're trying to work hard to, to um, have these conversations about social justice, transitional justice, racism, um, and that's a really good thing. So, you, yeah, you talk about Walter Scott. Let me take you to December fourth. Obviously, just yesterday, the attorneys for Michael Slagle basically said, "Hey, it was involuntary manslaughter," but the federal prosecutors basically said, "Hey, it was murder." When you think of it, is it murder or involuntary manslaughter in your mind? Well, uh, yeah, I, I have, you know, I just came from um, the sentencing um, for a, uh, um, another situation that, that um, my friend's son was murdered a few years ago. And I guess the way that works, I mean, I don't, I'm not a legal, right, I'm right, not right, a lawyer, right, but um, right, right. I think with the the because Michael Slager pled guilty, there's not going to be a trial. Um, and I think you're really just looking at the sentencing. Okay. So I would guess, and I don't know, because I've been focused on this other trial, but it's, it's similar in that it may be that the sentencing isn't that different. If, does that make sense? Um, in other words, the sentencing... Um, it, uh, okay, if it's in, if it's manslaughter, you I don't think you have death penalty on the table. I, I'm guessing. Okay, but um, they they cannot do the death penalty in South Carolina, e even though it's still on the books. They can't get the drugs to do it, so that's kind of the, it's a moot point right now. Okay, um, from what I understand. So if you're talking about how long the prison term is going to be, which is what you're probably that's the sentence, it may not matter that much. So I don't I don't know. Um I don't know. I um I don't you know you really have to the, the one thing I, I wrote a book with a lawyer and I, I was at the, the roof trial right. um a lot and 
you know what I understand about the law is it, it, it you you have it, it's a it's a literal kind of um, it, it works literally. In other words, you you have to look at exactly what the law says um, for all these different charges and be able to prove it. Obviously, but he already pled guilty, so I don't you know I don't know I don't know. Um, I don't know. In other words, I'd have to look at the wording of sure, each sure. thing sure. to see what's the difference. I know in the case of my friend's son, um, Lucas Cavanaugh, um, the, there were the, 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 the person who was the witness or what have you kept changing the testimony, and it, it, it might have been hard to prove a murder in court. Okay. Um, so um, even though the, the young man who committed this crime just got 18 years. So, if, if that makes sense, I think it has to, you know, it's, it's legal stuff that I don't really understand. If, if murder has to be, uh, I think, the conscious intent, and okay. you know, I mean, I, I, okay, I, I think that the um, Michael Slager case is one of the only ones that's gotten this far in terms of police shooting. So it's very important in terms of precedent setting. The fact that he pled guilty is is really important. It spares the family more another trial. Um, and remember, it was a civil rights right. thing, not a not the criminal trial. Right. Um, I don't, you know, we nobody would say that Michael Slager woke up in the morning and said, I'm going to go kill Walter Scott. He'd never mm -hmm. met him. So I think with murder, that's kind of how it's looked at, if that makes sense. Like okay. it, that conscious. Um, but on the other hand, he murdered Walter Scott. So I, does that make sense? So I think legally you have to consciously plan, and or that's how the law gets kind of cloudy. Okay. Um, so I'm not really answering your question, but that's how I see it. In other no words, I do, if murder is the conscious intent, the pl it involves planning, and you, it, yeah, you can't say that. On the other hand, did he murder the guy? Yep. <laughs> so, I mean, I shouldn't laugh. It's horrible. But I, so I don't really know where that, and I think that's what they're talking about. Like, well, you, you can't, you know, that's, that the law is designed to deal with these complex, um, you know, variations in sure. circumstances. Sure. Um, and, um, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't know um, how they'll, but you know he's he's definitely going to get sentenced to jail for a long time. I, I mean I can't imagine it's going to turn out otherwise. But I think the minimum is two years, right? If it's manslaughter. So we'll see. Let me go back to your book, and I thank you for giving me a copy and signing it a couple of years ago. But we are Charleston, tragedy triumph at Mavi Emanuel. Where is Charleston two years later in your mind? Well. Um, I'm heartened by work in the community to uh, consistently um, try to make things, you know, improve things here. Whether it's um, the work that, that the Charleston Area Justice Ministry is doing, the Illumination Project is now doing a, a program with my colleague Bernie Powers where uh, something we observed when we were in Nashville where all the new police recruits are now being trained in sort of the history of civil rights of this town so okay. that they understand what they're walking into and the nuances of it. I'm, I'm really um, heartened by the International African American Museum that we're going to get. I think it's, it's just such a counterweight to um, the um, inaccurate way history's been told or the erasure of so much. Um, so I think that that you know brick and mortar institution is going to go a long way to balance things. Um, I'm heartened by the fact that also <laughs> Dr. Powers and the right. mayor and others are right. working to uh, find a way to, um, to to put more accurate information on the monuments that are that honor the Confederacy. The markers. Um, you know, so um, I think that, you know, I I wish the schools weren't ranked 50th. Um, 
I mean, um, I'm, you know, equally disheartened by um, the report that came out um, that the Avery Center was issued a couple weeks ago, um, basically in terms of, you know, economics, education, health care, um, African popula the African American population in Charleston County is still, you know, um, the numbers are, are, are not good. Um, you know, one of the things we often say is the, the, the battle flag, Confederate battle flag came down off the State House in July of 2000. But what it stood for has not, I mean, you know, what it stood for and the sort of institutionalized racism um, in so many aspects of our society, schools in particular, um, that's still there. Um, so I see, I see a lot of good things happening, but I also know that we have a long way to go. The affordable housing, um, raising minimum wage, um, the schools should not be uneven and the, the, the segregation is it's it's you know I personally think um, that as a community we should come together and I think that rezoning would solve a lot of problems that's what the city of Raleigh North Carolina did and you know you 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 have to you I feel like with the schools where we make a little progress here a little progress there this one school we fix this thing here or there and um, but in, in it's 2017, and you know, if you think about the rise in hate crimes and the the rise in um, sort of accepted racism, I don't know how else to put it. Well, if you keep these kids separate all through school, um, you're just continuing the culture that enabled those things to happen. So, I think that's a huge issue that we got to deal with. Um, we also, as far as I know, we still don't have a hate crime on the law books in South Carolina, um, which was why, in Dylan Roof's case, it had to be a federal trial. Um, I don't know. There may be people, probably Reverend Pinckney's friends in the Senate, maybe working on that. I don't even know. Um, so there's a lot to do, but I feel like um, you have to jump in and um, find what you can do. Okay. to keep moving forward and um, there's a lot of good work happening in this community and uh, a lot of people working really hard um, to to change some of these things but it's a lot it's it can be overwhelming on the other hand there's a lot of people who um, you know one of the things I've thought a lot about is people I know who um, you know have just kind of forgotten about it, um, think, well, Dylan Roof's in jail, we didn't riot, everything is fine. Um, well, not really. <laughs> yes, he's in jail and we didn't riot, but it, it, it's, it's, it's complex why that happened that way. And um, I think that I see the same people working for social justice um, and it's, it, there's not that, you know, it's a small group of people who are doing all this work and I wish that more of the community was engaged in some of this work. Port Laureate, Marjorie Wentworth, <laughs> thank you so much. And this interview might be seen in the AP Research Center when they archive my interview soon, so hey. Oh, they're going to archive your interview? That's a huge Excellent. news, huge news. I announced well, it on social media. But well deserved, well, well deserved. <laughs> That's you. where it should be. Oh, thank I you. I love that place. Yeah, and you're so, a good part of it too, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. Well, thank you for this. No, happy to happy to do it. I don't know. I I'm I'm tired and oh, no, I hope I didn't say anything crazy. No, I but, don't think so. But actually, we we had a very positive experience last night. So I really admire the Citadel for making that effort, and that's what should happen. You should get different points of view. This these these are students, and that's that's part of how we have to think. It is un until we change the First Amendment, or you know, <laughs> you know. So that's the way the law works, right? Yeah. Well, well, thank you for this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good to be here. Good Likewise. to be here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.